have a talk with the Lord. We come to church. Not only to uh, draw close to Jesus. That's the big part of it. But we come to church to grow, draw close to each other as well. How many consider the people you meet here in church your friends?
Jesus prayed a prayer. He said, I do not pray for these alone, yeah. but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. So Jesus in this prayer included us in that prayer. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are Amen. one. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you feel a bond to the people sitting around you? You feel like you could call any one of those up and say, I need your prayer. I need your support. Amen. That's what being in Christ is all about. Praise the Lord. Now turn in the red hair to 286. I'm in the way. The glory land way. Praise the Lord. All the way to heaven. All the way to Thank you. 
and the trumpet sounds. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm going to get a space suit that is out of this world. Glory. We're going up. Hallelujah. If they're up there and if they're not all saved and they're in that capsule when I go by, hey, see you later, guys. Hey, Amen. I'm heading higher. Amen. Hey, God is so good. Great is the Lord. He's the one to put Mercury. I can't name them all. Linda, can you? <laughs> Amen. Jupiter. Mars. I know which one is last. Pluto. Can you imagine? He put them all up there and they all go around the sun. Never get out of space. Never get out of their orbit. Who figured that all out? If you came in the front door this morning, my dad's moonflowers are blooming. Big white. If go, they're going to be going shut after the church is over, but if you get a chance sometime, go out there before fall comes to see the big moonflower. Pick one off and smell it. Who made that? They come out in the morning, big and beautiful and white, and smell so good, and then they close up in the middle of the day and drop off. Who made that? Who made the little bird that flies through the air? We had a bunch of them in our yard last night. Little birds fluttering around in the bird bath and all of that. Who made my grand dog <laughs> chance to run after the little squirrels in my backyard? Thank the Lord, the Lord made that squirrel to be able to climb. <laughs> and he'd been in trouble. Amen. God. Scripture says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. Now the commanders are going to be playing football this afternoon. Commanders. And there'll be people out there. I saw them already on, on the news this morning. They had blankets. They had t-shirts on. They waving stuff already even before they get on the field. And they're going to there's going to be grown people out there. Some of them seniors going, whoo, whoo. I think we ought to be able in church to greatly praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Saints, being a part of the kingdom of God means we'll live in the great city of God. Would you stand with me and let us sing this for Let's stand this one time. Great.
of God, 1,200 miles cube. Can you imagine that? Set the city of God down in the United States. It'll reach from D.C. to the Mississippi River and beyond. Set the city down, it'll reach from the northeast, clear down to the southeast, cover the whole half of the United States of America, and then 1,500 miles high. Wow, what a city, the city of our King, the city of our Lord. And in the throne room, the floor is like pure glass, shining like quartz, gold, silver. The roads of the city, the streets of the city, paved in pure gold. And around the city, gates of pearl. Why do you talk about a city? What a city that's going to be. What a time it's going to be to serve the Lord. Isaiah said, he had an experience with the Lord. You may be seated while I read if you want. Isaiah was living in the year of a king called Uzziah. Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord. How'd you like to have that experience? Saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and his train That is his presence. Everything about him, his presence, filled up the temple. The robe of his Shekinah glory filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Bible tells us when the new Jerusalem comes down from God, there'll be no need of the sun because the light, the radiance from the throne of Jesus, from the face of Jesus, will outshine Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. But let's sing this morning.
who has no beginning and no ending. Can you want, imagine one who has always been, who has all power in heaven and in earth? Can you imagine the one when there was nothing he spoke and by the power of his words brought into being everything that is. He's magnificent, my Jesus. He's wonderful. He's glorious. He's so excellent. But he loves me. Just a speck of dust on this altar. He loves me. He's forgiven me. How many has needed forgiveness? He's forgiven us. Hallelujah. And he shed his blood. He came and took upon himself the form of flesh and shed his blood.
Sister Irene Duncan. She'd been in the hospital every now and then. She'd been getting some dizzy spells and off balance. The other day she flagged down her neighbor and they called an ambulance. She'd been in the hospital all week and during this visit, her family had decided she can't live at home anymore. That she has to go into assisted living. As I sat with her by her bedside in the hospital, my heart was broken. To come to that place in your life that you can't go back home. You can't go back among your things that you cherish. So keep Sister Irene in your prayers. That the Lord will minister to her spirit and soul in her life. And her little dog, Scooter. Sister Joanne had been told this week that she's anemic. So that's probably what's causing her tiredness and her weakness, inability to do anything hardly at all. She just basically has to sit in the house and do nothing. So keep. Sister Joanne, in your prayers, the Lord will be with her. It's good to see Sister Hope back. She's still needing to heal up from the operation they did on her foot. This week she got the opportunity to put her foot down flat again. Uh, I can't imagine, can you? Keep Sister Hope in your prayers. This thing will heal up. And is it Tuesday or Thursday, Maddie, you have a... Thursday. Thursday, you have an appointment in Hershey? Yeah. With the doctor, so... Um, your sister, Winbegler, used to be a part of this church. Some of you will remember her. Gladys Winbegler. She lived beside Linda and I after her husband died and her dad died. Uh, she moved into that apartment and lived there and we cared for her. I took her to the doctor still and the doctor that she went to for years had in his notes, literally had it in his notes. This lady has a tendency for things that are wrong with her to disappear. Praise the Lord. The doctor put it in his notes. I remember one time Al, when big and strong, he's still big now, before he got COVID, gave Sister Gladys a hug one day and cracked her rib. <laughs> And uh, she went to the doctor and they x-rayed and it was cracked. She went back again, shortly after that, it was gone. It was healed. She was a lady who was bit twice by a copperhead. Last time, never even went to the doctor. She lived to be almost 90. So God is still on the throne. I'm just telling you about things I've seen. Things I know God has done. God has brought Ron through this series of treatments. And he's still having to go through treatments. But Brother Ron, God has brought you through. He's taking you through. At times it may seem like a struggle. He'll take you through. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, God is still on the throne. Mm -hmm. I can testify to this. God is still.
Rosalia. I went to church years ago as a teenager up at Rosalie Applesburg. I had a horrific headache. Horrific. My head was splitting. There was a, a black lady there preaching. I don't know who she is today. I don't know what her name is. But I went up to her and I said, would you pray for me? I'm having a very bad headache. She laid hands on my head and prayed. It left instantly. And I've never had another one since as a teenager. Since that time. Tell me God's not on the throne. You never know what to expect. Amen? God is on the throne. Are there any other requests? Okay. Speaking of what not to expect, my neighbors that I'm very close to across the street, uh, her husband suddenly passed away in the house Friday morning. Um, if you'll keep the Springer family in your prayers, they were together 50 years had one child, they were very close. This is really hard. Went to the store and came back and found him. Well, I'm not sure if she found him then or if he asked her to get a medicine, but I think she left the room and when she came back, he was just gone. He was gone. I can't imagine. Pray for that lady. I've met her several times. Precious. I'm going to say, I need prayer. <laughs> the Lord brought you through things this week, Tracy. Yes, he did. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. And he's going to take you all the way. Yes. Right. All the way. Yes. Hallelujah. Who wants to pray? <coughs> Pray for us and then sing. Right. <laughs> oh God, my Father, how we trust you, how we must trust you, for you are good. There is nothing you do not see, that you do not know. And there is no one outside of the reach of your arms. There is great comfort needed, Lord. We need strength to get through the battle ahead and when we're weighed down with heart troubles and physical troubles, we get weak and we get we get uh, targeted, I think, by the enemy who thinks he can take advantage. But we have Christ uh, in us. Hallelujah. And with your strength, we can get through it all. Yes. 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 We love you. We praise you, God. Yes. Thank you for bringing people back from the brink of decisions that could have been made in the blink of an eye that would have had permanent consequences, Lord. Thank you for the life of a man who was good to his family and in the blink of an eye was gone. Thank you for the family that loved him. Please help me, Lord, draw them closer to you. Lord, let us all in this building do all that we can to draw ourselves closer to you and to grab the hands of anybody we can and drag them into your presence so that they too will know what a great and wonderful God you are. We will praise you, Lord, because we will not have the rocks cry out for us. It is your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, Lord. No matter the outcome, ahead of the outcome, despite the outcome, we don't 
It doesn't affect our praise because our praise is based on you, not us. So we love you, Lord, and we dedicate today's service to you. We just thank you for keeping your eye and your spirit on us all. In Jesus' name. Amen. I think the pastor had my, I think he was looking in my window when I was doing my great, <laughs> planning my song for today. He said, uh, he was talking about something this morning and he said, that's what being in Christ is all about. And that's the name of my song, Christ in Me. <laughs> I have a funny little thing to tell you. When I've been in the office since Sunday school. And the minute you all sing it, started singing, I'm in the glory land way. There's a cricket in the office, and that cricket started to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to share some scripture. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Yeah. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. Ephesians 1.13, in him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Colossians 1.27, to them, his saints, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isaiah 4.6 says, and then, and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat, for a place of refuge and for a shelter from the storm and the rain. Who is that shelter? That's my God. Amen. Haggai 2, 6, 8 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more it is a little while I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, that is the name of the Lord, the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Psalm 95, 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Hallelujah. And Daniel 4, 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is in you. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You will be able to make it through. Yep, I'm ready, Chris, when you are. Hallelujah.
James is a an epistle. An epistle is a letter. James is a letter of practical living. How to live your life. How to deal with life. You know that There are millions of people in the United States who don't know how to live. They don't, they don't know how to deal with life. They fall apart when something happens. So this letter written by James is a letter of practical living. Its concern is the life of the believer. If you're a believer, James' concern in writing this letter is about your life. After 
you have become a Christian, of course. You've been assured of your salvation. How many know you're a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. You know you've been saved. Yeah. Born again. Yeah. You are sure of your salvation. Yeah. Well, this letter is for you. It's for the believer, the life of the believer. The thrust of the letter is Christian growth. How many would like to go back to being a baby? You want to grow as a Christian to be strong spiritually. Last week now, I looked at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and the, the, the message was the essential attitude to trials and temptations. What kind of an attitude? Is there anybody here who's never had a trial? Is there anyone here that's never been tempted? No. We're all in the same boat. Even though we are Christians. Even though we are assured of our salvation. We will have trials and temptations. Now, last week I talked about what James said about what kind of an attitude should we have about the trials and the temptations. And James says, joy. James taught us that trials and temptations are allowed for our benefit, for our good, to prove us, and to make us strong. How else do you know that you can conquer unless you're given a battle to conquer? How else do you know you can overcome unless you've had a trial to overcome. So don't think it's strange when you're tested, when God proves you. <clears throat> when our children are growing up, we test them in different stages of their life. You're old enough now, you can stay by yourself while I go to the store. When you're 16, well, even though I don't know for sure, I guess you're still, you're to the place where you can drive a car on the highway. We've got a young person in the church now that has her learner's permit and mama will not ride with her. <laughs> not because she's so bad. I let her in my truck and drive it around the, over the field here. She did pretty good. I don't know if I'm ready to take her out on the road. <laughs> God is saying you're to be tested, you're to be proved, and trials and temptations 
come your way and are allowed to prove you. We learned the last week that the best attitude toward them is an attitude of joy. Not, you know, why you're putting me through this. Where are you, God? I know. Well, you let this happen to me. Huh? Carry on joy when you fall into various trials and temptations. Now today we're going to look at James chapter 1 verses 5 through 12. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me there. James is teaching us how to conquer. We saw the right attitude toward trials and temptations, one of joy. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a test, proving me that I can overcome, that I can grow stronger as a Christian. And now James is teaching us in verses 5 through 12 how to, how to conquer our trials and temptations. Listen, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith in God is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable in everything they do. Believers who are poor have something to boast about. For God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that the Lord has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises, and the grass withers, and the little flower droops and falls, <coughs> and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. God blesses those, listen, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and testing. <coughs> Read that with me. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Because afterward they will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Heavenly Father, we approach you this morning. This is your word. You anointed James with the power of the Holy Spirit and gave him these words to write down that become the word of life. So what we've read is the word of life. Now I ask you, Holy Spirit, come. Touch our minds. Touch our hearts. Touch my feeble lips of clay with the presence of the Holy Spirit that I may speak the word of life and that those who are hearing will receive the word of life and put it into action within their lives. Holy Spirit, rest upon us in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Trials and temptations again are 
common to all of us. We all suffer such trials and temptations as pain, lust, disease, divorce, loss, cheating, hurt, greed, accidents, death, sickness, separation, disappointment, immorality, emptiness, anger, loneliness, and lying. You could go on and on and on. Many times when I'm standing here preaching to you, I have intense, throbbing pain in my right foot. But I preach anyhow. We're all going to have some kind. And every day I put up with that. Every day I have that. Every day I take medication to calm it down. There are moments when it just seems almost unbearable. So all of us have different forms of trials and temptations. What is the worst trial you face right now? Think about it. Maybe you had a very good week this week and you didn't, you didn't, you didn't go through much. But think about it. What is the worst trial you face right now? What is your worst temptation? The temptation that just swarms in upon you and overcomes you and leads you into sin. What is that trial and that temptation? Is there an escape? Yes. Is there a way to overcome the trial? A way that can assure victory and deliverance? Is the, this is the subject of this passage. The way to conquer trials and temptations. Number one, James says, is ask for wisdom. Where did that come? Secondly, is rejoice in one's status. And thirdly, remember the reward for enduring a crown of life. And we'll get to the last two. First of all, wisdom. How can a believer conquer trials and temptations first? He must ask for wisdom of God. Now, wisdom means far more than just knowledge. You can get knowledge out of a book. You can read who says what about this or that. At my house, in my study, I have a whole shelf of books written by psychiatrists. And uh, if I know somebody's coming and they're dealing with anger, I'll pull the book out that tells how to deal with anger. And I get this man or several of these people who have written these books, I'll get their ideas. But I have to remember that that's just man's knowledge. Yes. Knowledge is not necessarily wisdom. Far more than just being intellectual about life and some area of life. Knowledge is about grasping the facts. And most people in the world have a head full of facts. My grandson amazes me. I don't care what subject I bring up. He knows all about it. <laughs> and, and it's not just off the top of his head. I mean, he's got it. I, 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 I don't know how that happens. You too. 
same thing you do and you get $150 a half hour. I do it for free. But he and I both, we can, we can tell you things to do. We can't tell you how to do it. We can't tell you, now you've got to do this. Then we'll get in trouble, you see. But we can give you ideas about what to do. Then it's up to you. So how do you take that, the, that knowledge? How do you take that knowledge that is given to you by the counselor, by the pastor, out of the book, how do you put it into reality? That's where wisdom comes in. Now, if we lack that kind of wisdom, if we do not understand, if we do not know how to conquer life, or how to conquer uh, some trials and temptations, then there is one way to get that wisdom. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. I don't think, as far as I know, I don't think there's a university any place on the face of the earth that has a course in wisdom. They have courses in knowledge. You can learn about this, you can learn about that, you can learn to do this, you can learn that. Even those who become counselors, and I, I'm a member of the AACC, the American Association of Christian Counselors. I've been a member of that for many years, and they are always coming out with new books and new learning and new courses. And, all of that as if you haven't learned it all yet. And so they give you all of this knowledge. You, you get that knowledge and you, you learn it and put it in your head so that when you sit down with somebody who's having a problem, somebody who is suicidal, that you have some ideas to, to give them some knowledge about how to deal with it. But in actuality, when it's all finished and done and said, there's only one place to know for sure how to deal with it. Go to God Hallelujah. and ask him, give me wisdom to deal with this situation. Yeah. Asking wisdom of God is the way to conquer the trials and the temptations of life. Now note two significant points. God gives liberally. God does not scold you for not having wisdom. James said here, you pray, you ask God for wisdom. He gives it to you liberally. He doesn't withhold it from you. I don't know how many times I've received phone calls, usually at night, and something's going on in somebody's life, and I get in the car, I get dressed, I get in the car, and head out through the night to go to these people, and, and when I'm going down the road, I'm not trying to look back in books and find out what to do or say. Well, as I'm going down the road, I'm saying, Jesus, I need wisdom. Amen. Give me wisdom. I can tell them this or that or the other, but oh Lord, we need wisdom. And you know most of the time when the answer comes, and I'm in a session with somebody, the answer comes when we are in prayer. Yeah. And we're taking this thing to God. And out of nowhere, out of nowhere, all oh, be yeah, out of somewhere, yeah. out of God, and the Holy Spirit comes the answer to that need, that life, that individual. God will not reproach you. You don't have to be ashamed 
to say, God, I need your wisdom. He will not reproach you. He gives liberally and does not upbraid. He doesn't rebuke you. He doesn't scold you yes. for not knowing how to handle the trial. He just wants you to come to him and ask him wisdom. Give me wisdom. When a trial hits you, and usually they come pretty hard, don't they? They hit you out of nowhere a lot of times. You don't know where it came from. And you're left spinning. But as soon as you get get your mind together and you understand what's going on, I'm, I'm having a trial. I'm having a temptation. That's when to go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I don't know how to handle this. Give me wisdom and he'll give it to you liberally. I don't know how he does it. That's the only place to get from God. I can't give you wisdom. I have a lot of knowledge. I've spent 54 years in pastoral work dealing with individuals and their, their trials and temptations of life and I can give out certain things of knowledge about this and that and the other, but when we bow our head in prayer and go to God and say, God, we need your wisdom, grant your wisdom, and out of nowhere he was, and you do that for you alone. When you're by yourself and you're going through a test in life, first of all, face it with joy, I'm glad, Lord, you, you, uh, you trust me to be able to deal with this and handle it and be joyful about it and know that it's for my good and it's for my better and improving me and testing me. Now, Lord, uh, in the middle of this test, I'm asking you, give me wisdom what to say, what to do. Another critical fact. We have a responsibility to ask in faith and not waver. If you left here today and went out to a restaurant or went someplace and you run into somebody and they you said something to them about God, they said, well, you should take your God and do whatever. I don't want to know anything about your God. Does that mean you won't believe in God anymore? No. Well, many years ago, there was a youth director for a state, wonderful Christian pastor or well, he wasn't a pastor. He was the youth director of the youth, act, youth activities for the churches in, in a certain state. Came from a family of, of preachers. Well known, the family was well known. He was in Pennsylvania, and he was there at the camp meeting, and they called him up, and they had diagnosed him with cancer. Lynn Stone was his name. Wonderful man of God. Loved God. The word went out around the world. General overseer of the church of God and high people, preachers in high places and had seen the power of God move in marvelous ways. Missionaries in other countries who had seen the power of God move. Prayed for Lynn Stone. And he died. Does that mean God's not real anymore? Does that mean because he died that God failed? 
We don't know the answers to all of that. Solomon, the wise man, said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, mind. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. When his wife was widowed, he had, I don't know, a child or two. They were left without their father, their husband. Did God fail? Did that mean that everybody in the church, well, God didn't hear Lynn, so we're giving up on God? No. Have faith, nothing wavering. We must do something. And whether or not God hears us depends upon doing this one thing if we do it god hears us and gives us wisdom to conquer the trials and temptation if we do not do it god cannot hear us if we do not have faith and believe in god when brother stone died he died victorious he died trusting in God. He had a quick trip to heaven. The little babies are buried. Sometimes I think, oh my, what they could be. What would they have been if they had lived? What would, maybe they would have been another Mozart. Maybe they would have been a scientist. Maybe they would have been, you don't know. I thought about it and said, God, that's not my business. I'm out of my realm. That's your business. But I trust you regardless. I trust you regardless. Faith without wavering. If you're going to God and asking him for wisdom, then do so because you believe in him. How many believe in him? You believe in him regardless of the trial. Right? You believe in him regardless of the temptation. You have joy in your heart while you're going through the trial, while you're going through the temptation, and you will have faith in him and will not waver. We must believe that God loves us and that he really cares and will hear our cries and prayers and meet our every need. When we pray and cry out to God, we cannot doubt. That is, we cannot ask and then wonder if God really exists. We cannot ask and then wonder if God really is going to hear. We cannot ask and then wonder if God is really do what he asked, what we ask. We cannot ask in faith and then wonder if we really know God well enough for him to hear us. We cannot ask in faith and then wonder if the request is the will of God. God says, ask what you will. God cannot answer the prayer of a doubting person. If he did, he would then be rewarding doubt. Rewarding those who do not believe or trust him. He would be rewarding those who doubt, ignore, neglect, question, and in many cases even curse, deny, and fight against God. God cannot hear and answer a person who wavers in his faith. Wavering is illustrated here by James. He said, you go down to the seashore and you watch the waves. They come, they rise, and they fall. A 
person is just like a wave of the sea, James said, taken by the wind and tossed to and fro. This person shall not receive anything of the Lord because the Lord cannot trust them to use his wisdom to conquer. So if you're going to ask God for wisdom to deal with your trial and your temptation, you don't know how he's going to do it. You just ask him for the wisdom and believe that he's going to answer. For many years, I had something in my head. I never went to the doctor to find out. But every time I would stoop over and be like something was going to burst. I had to learn a different way to squat down and pick something up. It went on for years. And I even asked, we were on a trip one time and there was a, a, a brain man, what do they call that? He, he knew the brain and I asked him about this and he said, well, there's probably something that you need to go have some tests run to see what's in it. And I said to God, I've asked you, Lord, and I'm believing you. I'm trusting you. Of course, all these thoughts kept coming. Well, you've got a tumor in your brain. You, you've got a, uh, an abscess or something in your brain. And it's going to burst one of these days and you're going to die. Well, do I do? God, I'm trusting you. Went on for several, three or four years. Finally, one day he just left. Not wavering, but trusting him. Believing in him. You will conquer this. I've asked you for the wisdom to do so. I'm closing up here. Wavering shows instability. The person who wavers in faith is a double-minded person said James, and he is unstable in all of his ways. A person who wavers in faith lives a life that is up and down, back and forth. His whole behavior is unstable and unreliable. So James says you cannot be doing that if you're going to ask God for wisdom help you with your battle, your struggle of life. In conclusion, the person who endures temptation shall be blessed. Yeah. Ah, Marco Rios. This refers to life, to be to the here and now. The word blessed means inward and spiritual joy and satisfaction and inner assurance and confidence that carries one through all the trials and the temptations of life no matter the pain, no matter the sorrow, no matter the loss, no matter the grief. Simply stated, the person is secure in this life. He knows that God is looking after and caring for him and her. Amen? It is going to deliver you from all the corruption and all of the evil of this life, including death. Give him eternal life. Hallelujah. 12, verse 12, God blesses those who patiently endure. Testing and temptation. Afterward, they hear, listen, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. What are you going to do when you have a trial? With the Dakota. Pray for wisdom. Have faith without wavering. Knowing that if you endure your trials 
trials and temptations of life, in the end, you have eternal life. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 You're not going to go into heaven limping. I see you coming into your pan every Sunday morning. You're not going to heaven that way. Amen. Glory. If you're 80, 86, is that right, Madison? Yes. 86? Uh -huh. I see you walking, you have a cane. But you're walking. You're not going to heaven with that cane. Praise God. Hallelujah. 